Hi, my name is Cindy Kutchik, and I'm a research intern at the Mississippi Valley Archaeology Center at the University of Wisconsin, La Crosse. Today, I'm going to cover the basics of gender chronology, or tree ring dating. For archaeologists, the dates and other information gathered from wood samples can help us to learn about how people lived in the recent and distant past, even thousands of years ago. The principles of dendrochronology chronology apply in many areas of the world where trees go distinct yearly rings, including here in the upper Midwest. Many of us have seen tree stumps or timbers with annual growth rings, and perhaps have even counted these rings to get an idea of the tree's age. Dendrochronology goes even further, striving to assign a calendar year to each ring and connect this with other data provided by the wood. Analysts do this by matching patterns in annual ring widths to the patterns in calendar dated specimens, a process called cross dating. Generally, this starts with living trees and recording their sequences of wide and narrow rings. Because the date of the outermost final growth ring is known from the collection year, the rest of the rings can be dated in absolute time. When the ring sequence in wood of unknown date, like a fallen tree or a beam from a log cabin, fittingly overlaps a dated chronology, the pattern stretches deeper into the past and older and older wood can then be dated. This close-up of a red oak cross section from Trempolo County, Wisconsin, provides an example of how rings vary in width from year to year, forming a distinct pattern. Tree ring dating is possible with a variety of wood objects and structures, including log and frame buildings, dugout canoes and shipwrecks, wooden statues, and large pieces of charcoal. Usually the species of wood involved, like eastern hemlock or different types of oak or pine, must grow rings that vary in width from year to year due to a primary factor, such as precipitation or temperature. A long sequence of rings, ideally 80 to 90 or more, as marked in the sugar maple core here, provides a unique growth pattern that can establish the correct dates of the rings. A shorter sequence, like what might be found in the spruce in the lower left from a preserved forest bed in Manitowoc County, often has similar patterns at several places on a dated tree ring sequence just by chance. Ring width chronologies tend to only correlate reliably with the same species and within the same climate region as well. So a lack of reference data for a particular species in the right time period and area can limit dating possibilities. Dendrochronological dates provide useful information in and of themselves, but they can also be considered with other lines of dating evidence, such as radiocarbon dates or dates derived from historical documents, architectural styles, artifacts of known date range or manufacturing date, and soil strata. Species and ring width data can also reveal which types of wood people used and where the wood came from or its provenance. In addition, tree rings record events like fires, floods, and insect infestations, as well as longer trends in climate. Not too far from La Crosse, labs at the University of wisconsin Platteville and the University of Minnesota's Center for Dendrochronology undertake environmentally focused studies on subjects like fire history and droughts. So how do researchers obtain tree ring data? They usually collect one or more cross section or core samples from wood in the object, structure or forest under study to measure and analyze their rings. Investigators try to take samples that end in bark or close to the bark indicating the presence of the final growth ring and revealing the felling date of the tree. If people used the wood soon after felling or after only a short interval for seasoning or preparing the wood, the construction date closely follows the felling date. A cross section like this piece cut from a beam from the Canadia Council House, a Seneca Haudenosaunee or Iroquois building at Letchworth State Park in Western New York State, can provide an extensive view of each ring's growth and reveal growth anomalies or damage in areas around the tree's circumference. The rings in the bur oak cross section on the right from near Holman, Wisconsin, provide an example of an irregularity. They bulge out in the lower left corner, which may indicate what is called reaction growth. This would have helped the tree stay vertical while it was living. 
core samples provide a single radius for measurement. They are minimally destructive to the element sampled and easier to transport and store than cross sections. Taking multiple samples from the same and different logs or beams, like these two cedar cores from the same tree, and comparing and cross-dating the samples ensures consistency of the ring width pattern within and between sampled elements. Combining cross-dated samples into a chronology reveals a common signal between the samples, and this allows for more reliable dating. As with an archaeological excavation, it's essential to document sampling activities for posterity and to aid in interpretation. This includes recording detailed notes, making maps, and taking photos of the context and conditions of the work and the materials collected, like the hole for core WLCH9A from the Canadia Council House. Once samples are transported to the lab, they must be prepared for analysis. Cores usually are glued into mounts, and cross-section samples, depending on their condition, might require taping to hold them together and padding for support. To clearly see the ring boundaries for measurement and to observe other anatomical features, samples are sanded with successively finer grades of sandpaper with an electric sander or by hand. Waterlogged, fragile, or carbonized wood can be carefully shaved with a razor blade to produce a clear view of the rings. After sample preparation, an analyst measures the width of each complete ring from the innermost oldest to the outermost youngest rings under a microscope using a moving measuring table connected to a computer. Dendrochronology software, such as Telero or Carina, records the ring width measurements in microns. In the bottom right is an example of a readout from a successfully dated sample. The innermost complete ring measured dates to 1693 and the last dates to 1768. After sample ring widths are recorded, the data can be standardized with software to account for growth trends in individual trees. This makes it easier to compare samples from different trees. The standardized sequences are then compared and relatively dated to one another when they show significantly matching growth patterns. Once correlated with one another, Individual samples can be averaged into a multi-component master chronology to compare externally with different sites and regional compilations. Individual tree ring labs maintain data sets, and one public source for external data is the International Tree Ring Data Bank, or ITRDB, run by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It curates vetted tree ring data from a variety of species and time periods, including from Wisconsin and New York, where one can find the Kennedy Council House and a variety of other historical buildings that institutions like the Cornell Tree Ring Laboratory at Cornell University have dated. Specialized software can analyze the ring with data and suggest the likeliest fit against securely dated chronologies. However, visual comparison of the line graphs of the chronologies with the ring widths plotted against the year is also key. Statistical calculations, such as the correlation coefficient R, are used to gauge potential matches. Supplied with a calendar dated master chronology, a researcher can then apply the dates for the master and component samples to research questions and form interpretations. If the samples end with bark or a wany edge with only the bark missing, they can speak to tree felling dates. Even if that is not the case, they can provide a terminus post-quem, date after which it was felled. It is also important to consider what the samples represent and how they relate to one another. For example, the dates of samples from different areas of a house might indicate multiple building or renovation episodes, or the context and condition of the samples might suggest that they were reused With that dendrochronology overview, let's take a quick look at a tree ring case study. This research, the focus of my master's thesis in archaeology at Cornell in 2013-2014, sought to provide firmer construction dates for the Seneca structures at Letra State Park and consider them in context. 
The Canandaigua Council House and the Nancy Jemison Cabin were both removed from their original locations to Letchworth. The council house was relocated in 1871-72 from what had been the Seneca Canandaigua Reservation. Based on documentary and architectural evidence, its construction date was estimated to lie between 1759 and 1780. Records and architectural studies suggested the Nancy Jemison cabin, which Nancy and her family occupied, was built between 1797 and 1800. It was moved from the Gardot Reservation to Letchworth in 1880. Nancy was the daughter of Mary Jemison, a Euro-American woman taken captive by a Shawnee and French party in 1758 and later adopted by the Senecas. With guidance and support from staff at the Cornell Tree Ring Laboratory, Letchworth State Park personnel, and others who had researched the council house and cabin previously, as well as permission from Mary Jemison's Seneca descendants, we successfully took 13 cores and cross sections from the two structures. Most of these samples were Eastern white pine and thus potentially datable with one another and existing chronologies. Once analyzed, they revealed some interesting dates. This line graph displays the white pine master chronologies from the council house and the cabin. The solid line in the graph is a multi-site compilation of white pines from central New York state. The patterns in each chronology with peaks at wide rings and valleys at narrow rings generally follow one another and provide visual confirmation of the dating. With the council house chronology stretching from 1675 to 1830 and the Nancy Jemison cabin chronology from 1711 to 1806. For the Canadia council house, the dendrochronological dates place its construction quite a bit later than the estimate of 1759 to 1780. One group of seven samples within the chronology clustered around 1820, as seen in the red bars in the graph. This is likely close to the original date of construction, as these samples come from different logs, likely aren't replacements, and a few have a wany edge. This does not necessarily contradict the historical accounts of a council house at Canadia. Rather, the council house standing now could be a later version. The second cluster of three samples ending around 1831, factoring in an incomplete unmeasured outer ring, could come from later renovations by a Euro-American man named Joel Seaton. He owned the property on which the council house stood after the Senecas left the area. The Nancy Jemison cabin samples here in green more closely align with the estimated building date, probably shortly after 1807, accounting for unmeasured incomplete outer rings. The 1883 beam, an Eastern hemlock, most likely comes from renovation with the cabin's relocation to Letchworth. The WLBT sample in blue, an oak, is from a dismantled cabin the park now cares for that once was owned by Thomas Buffalo Tom Jemison, a grandson of Mary Jemison. However, because we recovered only one measurable sample, it was not possible to firmly date it. This dendrochronological evidence also fits with the construction methods and architectural characteristics of the buildings. These show a mix of traditional Haudenosaunee longhouse traits and European-derived log housing features, such as half-dovetailed and B-notched corners. This in turn ties into the broader context of Seneca settlement and housing at the time, with threats to land holdings such as increased Euro-American incursion and the establishment of reservations, restricting movement, and factoring into Seneca decision-making and construction choices. Thus, the Seneca structures at Letra State Park provide a great example of how dendrochronology can illuminate the past and serve a valuable role in archeological and historical research. Many thanks to everyone who played a part in the research highlighted today. And thank you for watching. If you want to find out more about archeological topics, please see MVAC's website and the resources listed in the description box. If you want to find out more about how archaeologists study plants, please see the MVAC videos on flotation, both the long and short versions, 
and Dr. Connie Arzigian's video on Indigenous Ridged Field Agriculture at the Sand Lake Archaeological District.